topic of this conversation is going to be on alcohol dehydration reactions as we continue and wrap up chapter seven. So first, let's take a look at this term alcohol dehydration reaction. So of course, alcohol is referring to an alcohol functional group, and that alcohol functional group particularly is in the reactant. When we say dehydration, what we're referring to is that during the course of the reaction, water, H2O, is lost. So in other words, what's going to happen here is that water is going to be a product of the reaction. Just as when you become dehydrated, you lose water, the alcohol dehydration reaction as it proceeds is losing water. Water is a product of the reaction. Following the theme of chapter seven and looking at the reactions that form alkenes, alcohol dehydration is going to be another example of reaction type that yields alkenes. And we're gonna see that this reaction type has some parallels to the E1 reaction type that we talked about in our last segment, where we could describe the alcohol dehydration in many ways as being an elimination reaction, where we're eliminating water from the molecule. We say alcohol dehydration more specifically because of the fact that we are specifically losing water from the molecule during the course of this dehydration reaction. So what's going to happen to lay out the generalities of the alcohol dehydration is we're going to have a molecule that has an alcohol functional group. And we'll put in R groups here indicating that this could be whatever we want there. And then we, much like in the case of the elimination reactions, have to have at the beta position a hydrogen available. If this adjacent carbon, the carbon right here, if this were a quaternary carbon where there were no hydrogens available at any of these um, adjacent carbons, then the reaction would not be able to take place because during the course of this reaction, what's going to be lost is going to be this hydroxy group and the hydrogen from the adjacent carbon atom, that beta hydrogen, using the terminology that we used in the elimination reactions. That's where we get the loss of water is via the loss of a hydrogen and a hydroxy group from the molecule. When those are lost, in their place is going to be an alkene group so that we're able to fill the octet for both of those carbon atoms. So we're going to get a carbon-carbon double bond going on in our final product. And those R groups are carbon-carbon bonds or carbon-hydrogen bonds. They're indicated by R are going to remain the same. This particular reaction is catalyzed by an acid. And the particular acids that are commonly used here are often sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, or alternatively phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Oftentimes, rather than specifying that it's sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, since there are many possible options of acids to use here, sometimes it's just specified as above the area, you'll see the word term acid catalyst written. And that just indicates that there's a source of protons readily available in the reaction for it to take place. Um, and you can also sometimes see this as H plus or H3O plus. The idea is that there will be an acid there available as a catalyst. By definition, the catalyst is going to be a substance that lowers the activation energy of the reaction to allow the reaction to proceed more rapidly. The way that the acid catalyst is going to do that is at one step of the reaction mechanism, it's going to be consumed, and at another step later on, it's going to be reformed. So overall, the concentration of the catalyst, when we go from the start of the reaction to the very end of the reaction, is not going to change. If we were to monitor the pH of the reaction, we would see that it would remain the same, indicating that the acid catalyst, the acid had not accumulated or been depleted over the course of the reaction. Instead, overall, its concentration is going to stay constant because of the fact that when we start to dig into the mechanism of this, we're going to see that the catalyst is consumed at an early step of the mechanism, and then at a later step, it's going to be regenerated. So let's take a look at what's going on in the acid-catalyzed dehydration reaction from the perspective of the mechanism of this particular reaction. So we'll take a look at it for an example problem here. Go ahead and start off with this molecule. 
and we're going to react with our acid catalyst. So I'll just throw in phosphoric acid here. This could be any acid. You just need to recognize that there is an acid present there and recognize that that's going to be acting as our catalyst. And so what we're going to do is walk through the mechanism for this reaction. That is the step-by-step -step series of electron transfers that have to occur to go from reactant to final product. And we're going to use that mechanism to predict the final product of this particular reaction. Now, when it's time to write mechanisms that involve acids, such as phosphoric acid or sulfuric acid, where the acid is primarily serving as a proton donor to speed up the rate of the reaction, generally it is going to be fine for purposes of the mechanism to just put H plus as your abbreviation rather than writing out the full Lewis structure for H3PO4 every single time since the main portion of this, the business end of the molecule, is going to be that proton donation that it's going to be able to do. So let's take a look at the mechanism for this reaction. And what I want you to know and become aware of from here on out is that if you see an acid starting material in the reaction, generally what's going to happen in the very first step of the mechanism is that the other reactant is going to pick up a proton. The other reactant we could say is protonated. So anytime, not just for this particular reaction, but more broadly across reactions that we'll see all semester long. If there's an acid present in the starting materials, you want to try to use that as early in the mechanism as possible because acids tend to react very quickly. And so it's going to be a very fast reaction step to take us forward. So if there's an acid present, use it at the very first step of the mechanism, if at all possible. And this is going to be a general rule, not just something that applies to situations of acid catalyzed dehydration reactions, such as we're doing here. But in general, when you're looking at a reaction, a good hack is to observe if there's an acid present. Acid-based reactions are very quick, and so you're going to expect that the protonation step, the protonation of the organic reactant, is going to happen first off. So we're going to go ahead in and fill out the first step of this mechanism, since we do see an acid reactant there is going to be protonation. When we say that the step is protonation, what we're referring to is that the organic reactant picks up a proton. It's going to gain a proton during this step of the reaction. So we'll go ahead and write in our organic reactant. And now we think back to our previous chapters when we we're looking at acid-base reactions. We thought about what enables a molecule to act as a base to pick up a proton from an acid. And what we saw back then was that to be able to act as a base, the organic molecule needed to have either lone pair electrons or pi bonds. And so we look for lone pair electrons or pi bonds in our starting structure here. And that's going to be what is going to be susceptible to picking up that proton. So we're going to abbreviate our phosphoric acid as just H plus because that's going to be the ultimate business end of the phosphoric acid molecule. It's going to act as a proton donor, our acid. And then the only option we have here for what can act as a base in our starting material is going to be that oxygen atom, because the oxygen is our only location of lone pair electrons or pi bonds there. So we'll go ahead and use those, pi, those lone pair electrons to create a new oxygen-hydrogen bond in this acid-base reaction, or the protonation step, as we call it. So we're protonating the oxygen. So we protonate the oxygen. I'll show that new covalent bond in blue attached to our green hydrogen atom that we just picked up from that phosphoric acid from our proton donor. Now, if we look at the formal charge that's going to be here, we have to have a positive formal charge on the oxygen atom now. What we've done as a result of this protonation step is we've created a much better leaving group than was possible before. Because if we break away now that carbon-oxygen bond, the product of that step is going to be water. Whereas if we looked back at the original starting material where we had an alcohol functional group there, if we broke away that alcohol functional group, the product of that step would be a hydroxide anion. A hydroxide anion is really unstable relative to water. Water is much more stable. And so by protonating here at the first step, that's going to enable in the second step for water to be the leaving group. And that's going to be a much more favorable situation than having the hydroxide group try to leave on its own prior to being protonated. The hydroxide group is not a particularly good leaving group 
on its own because of the fact that the product of that step would be quite unstable. So instead we do the protonation first, and that's why this reaction is going to be catalyzed by the acid because the fact that we're able to protonate there is going to create a much better leaving group. A better leaving group is going to leave faster and that's going to speed up the entire reaction process. So step two then is that the leaving group leaves. So we could think of that protonation step at step one as really priming the reaction. It is going to enable water to act as a leaving group creating a much more favorable situation here at step two of the mechanism. So it's gonna make step two of the mechanism much less of a bottleneck than it was before. Step two is gonna go much faster and that's going to enhance the overall rate of the reaction since step two where the leaving group breaks away was the rate limiting step of the mechanism. So leaving group has left now, that leaves us with a carbocation and that gives us our water product, relatively stabilized water. And now we have a carbocation intermediates. And when we have carbocation intermediates, we look at ways to stabilize those because a carbocation intermediate is a relatively unstable intermediate here. We think about ways to stabilize intermediates as being either resonance or induction. We have no opportunity for resonance here. And so we turn to induction and how we can maximize that. And we have here a secondary carbocation. And we could increase the opportunity for induction here if we could convert this into a tertiary carbocation. And so this brings us back to a theme that we've seen occurring over and over again for both the E1 and SN1 reactions, where we can have a carbocation rearrangement or a one-two shift, if you like, to enable the further stabilization of this secondary carbocation by converting it into a tertiary carbocation, which will have more electron donating alkyl groups associated with it. So leaving group is left at step two to make that carbocation. Step three is that we get the one-two shift to give a more stabilized carbocation. Okay, so our one, two shift here, what we'll do is I'll go ahead and fill in our hydrogen atoms that are present in our structure. So we have a hydrogen atom there and we have a hydrogen atom here. And so if we take the hydrogen atom from right here, doing our one, two shift, we bring that over one spot, indicated with our arrow here. We take the covalent bond over. That's going to give us CH2 group and allow us to create a tertiary carbocation. So I'll go ahead and redraw in our skeleton here. And now in our skeleton, we would have the two hydrogen atoms here and here. And the methyl group is still right there. And now if we look at where our positive formal charge is going to have to be, it's going to have to be right here. And that's allowed us to create a tertiary carbocation out of a secondary carbocation. Tertiary definitely more favorable than secondary. So this is going to be an energetically favorable step, this one, two shift. So that's something to look for if we're using induction to stabilize here at this step. We want to maximize that induction by doing the one, two shift. Then at this point, we're going to carry out an elimination reaction. It's going to be quite reminiscent of the E1 reaction that we saw when we were working with molecules that had um, halogen leaving groups. So here at step four then, what's going to happen is that we're gonna get beta elimination. Of a proton to give an alkene. And the beta elimination occurs due to a base grabbing that proton. So we're thinking here now of the tertiary carbocation acting as the acid. Particularly, it's going to be the hydrogens outlined in green there that are, will act as the acidic hydrogens. And we'll have a base come in and grab those. And so that raises the question of what can act as a base. So it does not require a very strong base at all here to grab that proton because of the fact that we're working with a rather unstable carbocation. The carbocation is certainly only going to be transiently present during this reaction. Its end game is to get to a stable final product. So the beta elimination, the base that we can use here, can either be the water that we generated earlier in the reaction of that previous step where the leaving group left, or 
It can also be the conjugate base of the phosphoric acid that we started with. Either one of these will work. Really, we just need a source of bone pair electrons to grab a proton from this acid. So I'll go ahead and use water here. So we'll plug in our H2O. H2O is able to act as the base here because of the fact that we don't need a strong base to grab that proton because of the fact that this is an unstable starting material. When we finish this reaction, we're going to have a much more stable product. So this beta elimination should look a lot like what you saw in the E1, pretty much exact with the base grabbing a proton from the organic acid, the carbon hydrogen bond breaking and coming over to make your carbon carbon double bond of the alkene. So we'll go ahead and draw in what would result from those electron pushing arrows that we showed. And our double bond right here, our methyl group coming off like so. And then we would also be generating H3O plus as a result of this step. And when we see H3O plus, we can really think of that as being synonymous with H2O plus a proton. And so this is where we get the regeneration of the acid that we used in the very first step. So here the acid is regenerated. And that's why we would define this reaction as being acid catalyzed, because if we look at the whole mechanism, what we see is that at the early stage of the reaction, a proton is used. And at the last step of the reaction, a proton is generated. So the net here is a net gain or loss of zero protons. So hence, that's why we call it acid catalyzed. And we're going to see that this is a very common theme that we'll come across in organic reactions, is that in acid catalyzed mechanisms, we'll see that at the very first step of the mechanism, up here, the acid is consumed in a step we would describe as protonation because we're saying that the organic molecule is picking up a proton. And then at the very last step of the mechanism, we see that the acid is a product of that step. The acid is being regenerated, and that's why we call it a catalyzed um, reaction. We call this last step beta elimination, or we could also call it deprotonation because we're losing a proton during that step. So we're going to see this theme over and over and over again. And so it's a really good idea to get super familiar with this general idea that if there is an acid present in your reaction, you want to always look for a way, if possible, to use it at the very first step of the mechanism. And it's going to be possible to use it at the first step as long as there's a pi bond there or a hydroxy group. That is going to allow you to use that acid at the very first step of the mechanism.